Morning guys, thought I'd do another video. Um, this is one's in reference to uh, Doubting Thomas 333's comments around the cost of living in Australia. Um, it's, it's a much bigger problem. I know when I look at the costs that, that people are paying in London, I wonder why they're in London. Now don't get me wrong, I understand that that's where their jobs are. Um, and I know in my industry, there's a big push to get people in the office. I mean, this is why uh, when I'm looking around for new roles, they often go, oh, it's hybrid. And I'm going, well, who's paying for the train to go to London? Because I'm not living in London. And the train's what, about 40, 50 pounds a day per day. Um, so it's extortionate. And I don't think it's about, I don't think this whole thing is about the actual finance for an for a business perspective i think this is more about control see the thing is if you're locked into the inability to move because you got mortgages you got rent your cost of living is hand to mouth you shut up you can't you can't rise your head above um the parapets to actually make changes you can't be the nail that stands proud you've got too much to lose because you've got so little you can't sustain a heavy loss. So, so the fact is, this is not accidental. It's not coincidental. It's been an ongoing agenda for some time. Now, the reason I bring this up is because things tie together, together quite well. This is why I keep saying everything's connected. It's not as simple as, you know, like, like the fixation on knife crime in London. There were black, 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 black. But, Go to Glasgow. Um, it's white. White people stab each other all the time. Um, one of the areas there, I think, still has the highest mortality rate for males in Europe through drug overdoses, killings, etc., etc. It's brutal. Not in the media, though, is it? Because the fixation is create and divide. Now, for me, don't get me wrong, I understand these people coming in on the boats. Um, the numbers are way up. Richie Sunak's obviously fudged his um, statements, but he's a politician if you actually thought he was telling the truth at some point. Um, I, I, I would assume even if his number was on a birthday cake, they would be lying if he told me what his, his birth, his age was. They're politicians. Um, anybody that should be in office normally doesn't want it. And anybody that's in office and wants to be a politician shouldn't. That's my, my personal view on the majority of this. It's normally people that have been forced into politics um, because of need and normally make the best politicians because their views are not based on themselves and self-preservation or self-benefit. Yeah, benefit. Let's just call it benefit. Although the other word would be corruption, I suppose. It's... Um, yeah, so back to the housing. The housing is not a simplistic issue. I have to take it from the UK perspective because I've been watching this stuff for a few years and trying to connect why things are the way they are. Um, the UK, I think, has got too much embroiled in feminism. And the reason I bring it up, it, it goes back to when women wanted to have the choice of going to work. The choice as if men choose to go to work. Don't get me wrong, we do have a benefit system, but I struggle to sit around. I mean, this morning I've already done a workout for a half hour this morning. I'll be doing another workout later for half an hour. But that's me, half seven in the morning, getting up on a bank holiday weekend to go and do a workout while everyone else is still in bed, um, get updates on things like the Ukraine war and stuff that I have an interest in. I have an interest in the completely wrong side of it, by the way. I'm interested in strategy and things like that because I, I enjoy that type of stuff. Not in a morbid way, but I have an interest in strategy. Um, always have done. That's why I like things like um, the Total War series, you know, like the games, you know, Rome Total War, etc. It's around the strategies. Um, but even that, politically, is having a shift at the moment because it looks like the US isn't happy that uh, Ukraine is now targeting Russian refineries. 
is that a bit like the Greek ship off um, what's that bit around the top because um, obviously everything a lot of people think everything comes from the China end Russia or the Far East Siberia <coughs> <coughs> but there's like an enclave where the oil comes out. Greek ship, I assume some Middle Eastern country is involved in a transaction, but bizarrely that oil or gas was going to, well, I think was it the Netherlands? Hmm. Easy way around an embargo. So I wonder why countries would be worried about a um country that's been supported by the West attacking Russian oil refineries when in theory we aren't buying that oil. Um, but anyway, this is the thing, everything is a bigger picture piece. The, the feminism thing was about women wanting to have the opportunity to work and it sort of spilled on from uh, World War Two, you know, where a lot of the guys were either wiped out or they were fighting in the war. So a lot of women had to take up places in where there would be traditionally men's roles, and then when the men come back, a lot of them took the roles back, etc. Um, but part of that is actually understanding the time as well. So you've got guys coming back from war and want to go back to their traditional ways of working, etc., being the breadwinner, etc. And some of this stuff had changed. Obviously, politically, it changed. But the mindset doesn't transfer. Um, it's knowledge into something new just because people say it. We're back to the him, her thing, or he, she, or her, she. Who wants to be a her, she? You can be a her, she today. Um, but, but the whole um, changing people's views on things doesn't happen overnight. And so people going back from a war environment, firstly, the government doesn't want a rebellious nation. You want people to be subservient, going back to what they were doing, keep them preoccupied. This is the whole thing around, um, in America you had the white picket fence and all that little house thing, because that was to keep people occupied. It was, it's control. It's keeping you fixated and busy, because if you're busy, you don't rise against your nations. And that's where a lot of this is. It's not as simple as we are often perceived or told because we get these little snippets. That's why I was going left and right. The bits in the middle are the important bit. That, from the feminism to here and the cost of housing and everything else, has moved over time. It's not instant and there's many things connected through that thread. So with the rise of feminism, women thought, I want the opportunity to work. Now we're at the point of... Oh, so then we get to the next phase, which is if you have two people working in a household, you can have a bigger house. Now we're at the phase where too many people can't afford a house and you need two incomes to pay the rent. Where's the benefit for society um, for that? Is it the poor? Well, let's face it, a lot of them get their rent and that paid anyway by everybody else, normally in the middle. Okay, so it's not, they're, they're, I'm not saying indifferent, because let's face it, everyone's got squeezed a bit lately, because uh, of the hyperinflation on food and stuff. And I'll call it hyperinflation, because people simply fluff around words and actually then actually state the obvious that this is extortionate. Um, so you've got the, the food price never gone up, so that's affected everybody at the bottom level of um, the tree. Then your middle classes are being squeezed. They're being pushed further down. Um, because what you've got is they can't afford the houses. You've got the problem of, oh, now we're getting to the boats and other stuff coming in. You've got influx of people coming in that, A, need to be subsidised by taxpayers. People in the middle are the biggest uh, contributors to that, unfortunately. Um, I mean, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I think he's got it in there where he mentions about the fact that the middle class is helping the poor always end up paying because the rich will always find a way to pay, uh, get around the system because they pay for the best lawyers, best accountants, etc. That's probably pretty much it. And certainly, you know, it's summing it up. So you have an influx of all these extra people. It's coming out the middle. You're feeling squeezed because the price of foods have gone up, but you're going, well, why have they gone up so much? Well, you know what? Oh, it's energy bills. 
Right, when we're going energy efficient about 15 years ago, what's the relationship between that? I mean, I get it with the, you got strawberries being grown in these farms that are running 24 seven, you know, a heat inventor, you know, the chemical treatments, etc. Same as gas in tomatoes to force them to go uh, from green to red, even though they're really not ripe. In, in my personal opinion, when I eat one of these, it doesn't go, mmm, that's really tasty. It's as if you almost got a bite of an apple. It's that there's no give in it. Um, which was reinforced to me recently, uh, well, last couple of years, by one of our um, one of the properties we look after in Spain. The the owners there reopened their farm. The family have had a farm for about three hundred years, and the owner, one owner's a funny enough a biochemist. The other, the other one's a, a lawyer. The lawyer, the husband, decided to redo their farm, do an organic farm. And um, they invited us up for the day. And you instantly can taste the difference. I mean, the potato, the, the potatoes. Well, the potatoes would definitely taste better anyway. But the tomatoes, you can feel the weight of the water in it for a start. You can damage it by squeezing it. The taste on it is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal taste that reminds me of tomatoes 40 years ago. And the thing is, they're using seeds and stuff that I think they even the seeds, the, you know, the family relationship on the seeds is about 200 years. They, they really know what they're doing. Um, but the fact is, we've gone commercial and full on mass production on everything. Everything. It, and you look at how we're absorbing this information as if it's gospel, truth and healthy, you know. It's like with supplements, vitamins and stuff. Don't get me wrong, in Asia, people are obsessed with it. You know, when I was in the Philippines, everyone's on about, you know, they're taking tablets for, for, for everything. And I get it because a lot of people don't have this stuff in their diet. Um, but at the same time, I find in the UK, you go around a supermarket, the opportunities and choice around food produce is very limited. It's lots of frozen food, lots of packaged food, lots of tins. Look at the fresh vegetables and fruits. It's probably the smallest section in a uh, supermarket. Probably even smaller than the milk section. And we're getting all these weird milks now. You know, it's, uh, you know, from nuts and whatever. Just wait for a cat's breast milk or something to appear on there. There's a heavy little bit of crap in there. Um, but the point being is we've moved so far from where we started. When I was a kid... Potatoes, we're back on potatoes. We used to get a sack of potatoes dropped off um, by the potato man once a week. This is what gets me when people start to go environmental and everything else. We used to go, right, milk was delivered by the milkman. You'd also drop the bread off. Uh, you'd have your newspapers from your newspaper person. You'd have the pot man come round every Thursday. Your potatoes were delivered on a Wednesday. Your coal was delivered on, you know. And people go, coal? Yeah. When I was a kid, there was coal because um, we lived out in the middle of nowhere. Um, <coughs> but the fact <coughs> this stuff already existed, and then they're they're trying to make out that they they've come up with some solutions or amazing ideas. Most of this stuff was already here. But anyway, we're back to the thread. Why is it important? Sack of spuds back then, I think, it was three pounds fifty for was it twenty five kilos, twenty two kilos, big sack of spuds. So let's just say. 15 quid today, Let, let's say 20 pounds, let's say 20 pounds, um, which is extortionate for potatoes. But you get a big sack of spuds, and that's pretty much your stable diet. That is, if you're skint and got nothing else, you're having chips tonight. Um, but then you have your spam and chips, egg and chips, sausage and chips. But <clears throat> most of this stuff, it's not messed with. It's not got add added salt. It's got no added sugar. It's got no, no preservatives, additives, colorants, any of that crap in there. So when you're younger, you, you well, you probably you may think the same. Why was I much healthier when I was younger? Because there was no crap in my food. It was literally that's a potato. There was nothing else in it. It's a potato. I haven't factory processed it, shoved it in a little box, and 
stuck a bit of uh, chili con carne with loads of salt and sugar and crap in there. You've got a potato, you want chili con carne, go and make it. And I think that's one of the big things that's important is understanding we have transferred our abilities to state and corporations. Because back then, the person who stayed at home would make the meals. So you'd have your egg and chips, bacon chips, whatever, your parents. All right, let's just say woman. The woman, let's be honest. The majority of the time it was the, the female. I remember when my mother was sick, my, my father's view on things, well, I've made this, if you don't like it, it's going in the bin. Or the other one was, if you don't like it, you'll have it for your next meal. So completely different parenting styles, depending on which parents in the house. But the fact is, my mother's predominant thing was the food. And she wasn't a great cook, I'll be honest with you, but she did have um, a lot of variety and stuff. So you'd have your vegetables, you'd have your Sunday roast, you'd have your, so you knew on a Sunday you would get your vegetables. How many other people out there today are getting vegetables at least once a week? I mean, I watched some of that stuff with Jamie Oliver and the fixation on pizzas and kebabs and crap was just beyond, I, I don't even understand how some people think that way, but anyway. Um, but the thing is, sack of spuds cost this, sausages cost this, all this stuff was much, much cheaper because you're making it yourself. So your food costs have gone up. You then look at the fact <coughs> that, because let's face it, the other thing is you can produce on mass. So if you had like little trays and stuff, a friend of mine did it with his mate, because um, he used to swap every week, they would, they, you know, they would swap meals with each other. Because there's only the two of them, Not they don't live together. Uh, they're they're um, two single guys that basically will cook for each other so that they sort of get a bit of variety because they'll, they'll freeze meals and have like a Thursday dinner together, that type of thing. Uh, <coughs> but the fact is, we've gone from this cheap way of living where you may have had your rent to pay, you may have had your mortgage, but it was proportionate. I think the back then, the, the, the your mortgage would be, what, a three-to-one ratio? So your wages could only be, was it three annual salaries or something? Where are we today? The mortgage is, is just excessive. Um, your food is either high production or the fact that instead of making a cup of coffee, which comes out of a jar that costs, what, five pounds, you're paying about five pounds per coffee. Why? Because we've been culturally led that this is the way you should be. Go into the office, grab a coffee on the way. Have a coffee in the house before you leave. I'll do what I do is actually just make a coffee and take it with me in the car. I don't take it on the train because I've got the electric scooters and that'd be an incident waiting to happen trying to carry a coffee on a scooter. Um, but, but the reality is we're wasting money and we're being encouraged to waste money and we're, and we're being pushed down this big path that is not for our benefit. You look at where we were back then Hardly anybody we knew owned a car. Now everybody's not only got a car, they've got to have a new one. Um, and now, I thought you had a new one three or four years ago. You've got to have a new electric one. Um, the debt is being stacked on us on purpose. The mortgage is a lock-in for life because the majority of people cannot, cannot afford a mortgage. The people that are most likely most like to be rebellious cannot afford a mortgage. Um, the people in the middle become fixated on their just paying the bills and just trying to get ahead, etc. Yet the game's getting stacked against us. Even to the point our own pension system now is going, well, there's no money for you, but we'll still keep taking money off you. Um, but it's very likely there won't be a pension fund for you. In fact, we've got a great idea. Pay into this other pension fund um, and there might be some money for it. I sit there and go, hang on wouldn't it be better to just put it in an investment fund and try and avoid anything to do with the state control it? Why do I need the state involved in what I'm doing? Because they seem to make a complete hash up of everything I'm doing, personal opinion. Um, and I'm not going to market this, but it's worth looking at things like Vanguard in your, your ISA, 
because you can stick a hundred quid a month to whatever up to 20 grand a year um, and build up your own investment I think mine's performing about 12 percent a year at the minute uh, on that side um, because there's no incentive to me to have savings because I'm already in the higher tax bracket. It's just, it, yeah. Anyway, so they're drawing the money out of you. But worse than that, they're drawing your life out of you. Because back then, everything was sustainable, easy, easy going. You go to work, you pay your bills, you move forward. Now, you need to be the better you. Your job's at risk. AI's, at risk. AI's coming in. You're now in need to retrain and keep retraining, improving yourself, being better than everybody else. And now we've got all these other people that are coming in from other places that are taking all the menial jobs and will slowly work their way up. As they work their way up, the value of you comes down because they'll do it cheaper. That's, that's the reality, in my personal opinion. I mean, if you speak, I come from the construction and uh, maintenance industries for you know, building maintenance industries. And we've seen it when uh, the rise of the, the Polish or whatever coming into the UK um, because it allowed the construction and maintenance industry to be suppressed. It's definitely the maintenance industry. Construction, a little bit more difficult, but that's, that's where you start getting your influx of uh, Polish, etc. Start moving the jobs as the whole EU piece opened up and then into manufacturing. Now, the Im immigration piece has two effects. The first effect is the direct one on the nation, which is, it can either be positive or negative. The positive one is you end up with skilled labor, you can end up with people that are actually benefiting the economy, you've got people that want to stay and develop with the nation. You got other ones which I've seen in the uh, furniture industry. They come into the UK, learn all the skills, and then go back to where they come from, set up a manufacturing with the same plant equipment. They know the point of contact for these people and start um, targeting the, their former employer's uh, client list, being able to manufacture it cheaper um, for very many reasons, not getting into health and safety and whatever. They're, they're, Realistically, the labour is cheaper anyway. If you start looking at all the other bits, you, 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 you're down a rabbit hole. We're not really concerned with that. The fact is you've moved an entire business away. That was already happening in the late 80s, early 90s anyway. Um, I know people that do things like bun feet for um, pine furniture. And they already moved to the east uh, from the UK, they moved their entire factory to these because of the extortionate business rates and stuff in the UK. Um, so that was already occurring anyway, because bun feet is by nature is not a big owner. So to keep the business viable, they had to go east. So in reality, some of this stuff is a natural occurrence. Other stuff is manipulative. You know, like I'm saying, when you start to reduce the cost of construction in London because you're suppressing labor rates by influxing people. That's not for the benefit of the nation, that's for the benefit of individuals. Um, that are obviously landowners, property developers, etc, etc. Hence, we're getting to where we are now, where, which gets back to the main topic around the cost. Why, why is it so expensive to live in Australia? the same as you find in the UK, because I see rents have gone up phenomenally in the UK. Um, the reality is, it's all about control. And we've been led down this rabbit hole, a lot of it with media, because you look at how many TV shows are telling you to redevelop property, get a second home, flip a property, do this, do that. It's all about pushing the cost of housing up. Now the cost of housing up, going up um it has two effects firstly if you can flip the properties you can make money yourself great um but at the same time you're progressively taking the ability to get in at the bottom further and further away because there'll be less and less properties to develop 
um, because you see an opportunity where someone else is scraping together a deposit to make buy their first home, you've gone in there, renovated it, flogged it. Um, and now that's above what they could afford in the first place. So let's increase their mortgage ability so they can, instead of getting three years, uh, let's make it a decade. You know, 10 times their, uh, 10 times their salary equivalent per year so they can get on the ladder. Mm. So how long is the mortgage gonna last? Interest rates jumped, and I think we're about to see the collapse of some properties in the UK. Or maybe not. There'll be a lot of repossessions, but the banking system has also been altered since the crash, I believe, where they just lock property, the value of the debt to you and your account. So it's not a case of you, the bank is printing money. The, uh, in the sense of there's a guy going right we need another million pounds okay get the printer on they're just doing it in numbers doesn't mean your debt's any less it just means the money is just being created out of thin air hardship and everything else is still is locked into you because um, you may have 25 years plus to repay this thing but at the same time they're making the numbers it's not it's not correct. It's not, um, it's not, I mean, I, I can't even get into why people would think this would be acceptable, but the banking system's working that way, <clears throat> probably because they got hurt hard in 2008. Um, <clears throat> so we have control. It's all about control. You've got people influxing that are going to destabilize your um, environment. Now, the problem you've got here is it can go two ways. The local populace start an uprising and become very difficult, or people just accept it. And I think we're down the rabbit hole of people just accept it. Um, why is that? Well, if you look at the way Western males have been put under attack in recent years, it's to say that they've got um, masculine issues. Well, funny enough, being masculine goes with being a man. But it's, it's much deeper than that. It's to stop you contesting against anything. Like the day there is and all that. You're going, well, hang on. Do, do what you want. Because my view on most things is I could have a T-shirt and say, I just don't care. You know, not interested. You know, if you want to go to a gay bar or whatever, fine. You won't find me in there. But I don't mind you having a bar. And I don't even care if it's got a big sign on it saying gay bar or whatever. I don't care. Um, you, that's that's your thing, you know. It's the same as I've got friends that are fixated on programming and stuff. They're obsessive with it, like OCD obsessive. It doesn't mean I hate them or whatever. In fact, is that just the conversation can be very dry and boring, but it doesn't make any difference for me. That's the same as somebody saying I'm there, them, or whatever. It's like okay, I'm just not interested. I'm interested in the output. You know, if you've made a new piece of software that can revolutionize them, I'm interested. But getting into the lines of code and stuff, it's like not interested at all. I've got enough headaches without having yours as well. Um, so, so the point is, a lot of this stuff is around destructuring males. And we're being demonized, whether we like it or not. Um, or whether people want to accept it or not. We have been demonized. And it's not even constructive. It's, 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 it's sort of whittling away. It, but at the same time, it's not a... The reason it's not constructive is if you start putting people in this... Um, say people start taking my role just because of their demographic or they're a woman, etc., doesn't mean they're better than me. It just means they fit a demographic. And I think, like I said, that's where imposter syndrome and stuff started starting to evolve out of that, where people realise that they're rubbish or whatever. Um, but the, the, the whole point of this is that's the path that's been drawing out. We're down this weird path, which I actually do think is around a separation that's similar to China, uh, where you we will be suppressed 
because we're being suppressed financially through masculinity, um, the cost of living, because everything keeps getting hammered. And at the same time, you've got this false elitism. And I call it false because I don't like using the term elite. Elite is the assumption that they're actually of value. They're not the parasites. Um, but that is separating us out. I mean, this whole... I'm waiting to see where all the money went for what they've spent. Was it nearly 500 million pounds they've spent on stopping the boats um, coming in from Calais, which has done absolutely nothing. Uh, where did all the money go? And as I say, why, why are people coming? Well, that's the big question. Why are people coming? How are they getting encouraged? Who's funding it? Because it's never as straightforward as we see. There's always, like, don't get me wrong, fully understand people coming in from uh, Ukraine, Syria, etc. These guys are in conflict. When you start to get people coming in from uh, predominantly nations that aren't in conflict, which are just impoverished, um, then they shouldn't be here. And I really mean that in the best best way forward because we've got enough problems. The influx of these people, in my personal opinion, is is devaluing the entire working class of the United Kingdom and other places, other nations, Australia. It'd be it'd be the same everywhere because these people shouldn't be there. They're being brought on purpose. They're being there to devalue everything. Um, because let's face it, the more you're forced to work for less, the less likely you're going to cause trouble unless you start hitting things like famine and stuff and then the whole game changes overnight um but i do think we're looking at a two-tier system being brought in over time and i do think like when you look at the way the media is orientated it's about who owns them who pays for the advertising who controls them um it's the same as I've just seen yesterday, I think it's Legion of Men, which is something that I was looking at from the personal development and the MGTOW type stuff. And I fully understand it about how this whole system is working, about being more stoic, etc. I don't see these guys, I mean, don't get me wrong, you see some of the comments, you can see some people do not like women, etc. But I also understand that comes from somewhere. You know, whether it's being brought up in a bad relationship, whether it's having an ex-wife that's robbed you blind, what, there, there is many reasons this occurs. So it doesn't mean that all men are like that. It doesn't mean that their anger is fixated on all women, but their experiences. But the reality is they've been targeted by bots. Um, like basically spamming and pushing up their obviously their uh, readership or whatever to the point they've been demonetized. Now, why would somebody do something like that? See, the, see, the funny thing is, most of the stuff we have these days, and this is the biggest headache, is we're sitting in the same environment that is trying to control us. So you sit in this this bubble we're in now. I'm sitting on a platform that we know has many things going on around its own obscure um, policies because it just chops and changes as it feels like. That's a control mechanism. We know Google has it. Look at their recent um, AI, <laughs> AI fiasco. Um, we're in a realm where we're stuck here where we actually need to separate some of this stuff out but you still need to have a voice in the system as well as be outside the system to actually be able to develop it and that's where it gets interesting because that's the hard bit because let's face it we're now in an environment where people are trying to drive down the cost of labor the labor comes down we're now the labor comes down control cuts higher it's, it's but it le does reach a point where it bubbles over. And that's the bit um, that concerns me. Because when that does happen, we're in a whole world of pain. 
because that's the stuff that leads to wars, famines, and massive changes. But I also recognize that a lot of these people coming in from other nations are in nations that have got massive problems and culturally or accepting normalities. Should we call them normalities? Neutral normality sounds better. What is acceptable by others from other places? Normalities <coughs> is being ingrained and it's being pushed as an accepting thing. Um, I'm not going to get into police stats and everything else because you can look at it yourself, but you can see that stuff is suppressed on purpose because these are normalities for others where we find it disgusting, unacceptable, etc. But if you suppress it, you're not talking about it. And if you're not talking about it, you don't do anything about it. Um, but yeah, I know it's slightly off tangent from the housing, but it's all linked together because everything goes through this massive thread because your housing is based on your personal thing of have your own home, 2.4 kids, car, new car on the drive, blah, blah, blah. All this stuff has been the stuff that's been pushed to people. Well, be since the nuclear family, wouldn't it? My personal view is, for my kids, we'll function as a family unit, same as we do in the Philippines. We, you know, we've got apartments. We've got people living in our apartments that um, we we combine our strength. Now, that may seem a bit odd, you know. Like, for example, if I buy next door, rent it out to my kids, decide to get married, and then they, you know, they not my kids get married, but you know, they get a partner. Um, I would try and keep the family unit together um, because it's strength in numbers. Now, the bizarre thing is, people coming in on the boats, etc., recognize that. And that's not new. This is why you find the Chinese communities work very well. Well, so they just say Asian. Because, see, the funny thing is, I separate India and Pakistan from Asia, but they are Asian. It's just always has been for me that I've always seen India and that as separate. Don't know why, because they're, they're all part of Asia. Um, but they function as a group. The Somalis function as a group. I'm not sure how in-depth it is. I've only seen what they get up to in Birmingham. Because um, they, yeah, they're a strange bunch from what I've seen and experienced and people I know, you know, the... The friend of ours was a butcher. I don't, I'm not sure if he's... Well, he's, he's dead now. But um, the Somalis used to target his butcher. They'd spray um, deodorants and stuff through his um, vents for his rotisserie, for a chicken, to the point they had to throw a chicken away and then redo it all. And then the police come and it's... You know, they're all like... Mm, they're, you know, there's poor Somalis. Yeah, whatever. Um... But they were selling meat in their community room. And they would, because in Birmingham, like, you can get like um, tax free. I don't know if they still doing it, but they were doing. You can, like, say, open in a shopping center that's controlled by the council. There's empty shops. You can open a community center there. Um, it'd be tax free or whatever, say, three years, five years, one year, whatever. So you're basically paying nothing, uh, pretty much. And they were selling all sorts in there. You know, they were selling meat. They were selling, you know, illegally working their own businesses amongst themselves. Um, and yet they would target the butcher as if the butcher was the problem. The same as he did halal meats. And they were like, how can you do halal meats? You're Muslim. You're not Muslim. Um, and the reality is, is because it's to do with the cuts. It's to do with it. You know, it's a bloody professional um, so the thing is I'm thinking about the stuff I've seen over the years because I used to deal with local authority housing um, and I've been in some houses where we've had to rip out the entire floor because there's been slaughtering goats in the house and this is normalisms uh, oh. 
just knock my, knock my camera over. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's like a normalism for, 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 for others. They don't see a problem with that. You know, and it, this is the problem, but we're inheriting this stuff and we're accepting it because we're not telling them that it's wrong. We're not, we're not telling them there's a risk of disease infection and the fact that um, then the slaughtering meat and cutting it up in your house um, doesn't comply with the same regulations as an abattoir, for example. But anyway, what do we know? Um, but yeah, everything's tied together. And like I said, a lot of this you'll find it's gone from one person provided for the house, paid the bills, etc., to two people, to 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 now that bubble has pushed up the housing pricing, and it, then we moved into this market that's encouraged um, flipping houses and maximising profit with renovations and stuff. So when people ain't got a lot of cash and could get a rundown house and renovate it so they could actually afford a house. Those opportunities have pretty much disappeared. Um, and we're now in the realms of, well, we'll just loan you more money. And then when you get to the point where we can't loan you any more money because you can't, you can't afford it, you're then locked into the next thing, which is people with properties, they can't sell them. A bit like buying crypto for a coin that could be the next best thing but you can't offload it because everyone's waiting for it to be the next best thing so you can you can buy it but you can't sell it and if i was a multi-billionaire landowner at the moment i wouldn't be looking at buying any properties off us i'd be looking at taking the repossessions let's see where that goes and I think this is where the problems are. I think this is where we're now facing an environment that's not just about the living crisis, it's about what's available and where the future's going. Because at the moment, there's very little for too many people that's inspiring or driving them into a positive space. We're creating prisons, financial prisons. They just lock people into just doing as you're told and shut up and put up but anyway that's my opinions my thoughts love to hear your comments thanks